Good morning. My name is Jerry DiColo, and I'm the Metro Editor at the Times-Picayune. I want to welcome you this morning to our Hurricane Readiness Roundtable, where we'll talk with a number of local experts on what the best things you can do this hurricane season to keep you and your family safe. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, AARP, and uh, right now we will show a brief message from them. AARP Louisiana is honored to sponsor today's town hall with the advocate. I'm Bobby Savoy, AARP Louisiana Volunteer State President. Just like many of you across the state, I know what it's like to lose your home to a natural disaster. That's why I'm dedicated and passionate about educating others on disaster preparedness and recovery. And so is AARP Louisiana, connecting you to organizations, subject matter experts, and resources is what we do best at AARP Louisiana. We also fight for older adults at all levels of government. In fact, at this past legislative session, our volunteer advocates fought for better emergency planning at nursing homes and independent living facilities, and more options for older adults to live at home as they age. We welcome you to join our AARP Louisiana team. To learn more and to get involved, visit AARP.org slash LA. I'll now introduce our uh, moderator for today's panel. But before I do, I'd like to um, just briefly mention the Times-Picayune's Hurricane Center newsletter, um, which will give, keep you up to date on information about a storm when it's coming. Uh, and also on other alerts and uh, information about storms through the season. And that is at nola.com slash hurricane. Uh, to moderate our panel today is Mike Smith, our environmental editor at the Times-Picayune. Mike, good morning, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Jerry, and thanks for joining us. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce our panelists for today. We have three experts uh, on this topic who will be able to um, uh, hopefully um, give us some great tips on hurricane season, how to prepare uh, both before and and uh, and how to respond even after. Um, so I'll start with uh, Ruby Douglas. Um, she currently serves as the preparedness section chief in the emergency management division for the governor's office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. Um, she uh, she has won a series of awards and commendations for her work in coordinating, collaborating, and cooperating. Uh, in cooperative endeavors uh, that have supported preparedness planning, response recovery, and mitigation efforts on the state and local level. Um, she's responsible for networking and providing resources and information to various state, federal, and local agencies and organizations. Um, our second uh, panelist is Colin Arnold. He is director for the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness for the city of New Orleans. Um, NOSEP is the coordinating public safety agency for the city of New Orleans, responsible for administering the city's crisis and consequence management program. It coordinates the city's preparedness for response to recovery from and mitigation against crises, both natural and man-made, through all hazards planning. Uh, Collins worked for the city of New Orleans for over 23 years. That includes um, with the New Orleans Police Department um, and some other roles. Um, uh, Next, I'll introduce Steve Zimmer. Uh, Steve serves the community as United Way of Southeast Louisiana, Louisiana's long-term recovery director. Uh, he, joined, he rejoined the organization in 2021 to lead recovery efforts in response to Hurricane Ida. In that role, he helps oversee regional collaborations among community partners uh, on long-term recovery. Uh, this is designed to identify local disparities and gaps in services and provide unmet needs to affected households. Um, so with that said, I'll get started with the questions. Um, so maybe we'll go go around and ask each of you kind of what what are some of your your top tips for preparing for this hurricane season? I'll just add quickly to that. You know, we are expecting an above average season this year. The um, NOAA has predicted that uh, that's based on, you know, we have very warm waters in the Gulf. Um, which can feed hurricanes and cause them to intensify very quickly. Um, so obviously preparation will be very important. Um, so Ruby, maybe if we start with you and you can describe some of your tips going into this season. 
Well, I think it's important. I think, as you said, Mike, uh, you know, we are definitely looking at above average uh, activity for this hurricane season. And this is not unusual. If you look at the past consecutive years, we've actually topped out on all the named storms and uh, actually receiving uh, formations of, of depressions and uh, weather events to monitor even before the season starts. And so I think that that teaches us that we have to be looking at and be more vigilant about weather predictions. I know our citizens uh, have been very, very, very much practicing their emergency preparedness kits, but preparedness is more than just bottled water and peanut butter. We have to be looking at what these catastrophic storms may occur. Uh, and sometimes we looked at evacuations, which usually has only lasted usually three days and you could come back and return and rebuild. But we're looking at catastrophic damage. And so this hurricane season, I think it's important for folks to be looking at their true pre-planning for evacuations and possible stays if we have destructions and infrastructure damage for these impacts because they could rapidly intensify. And, you know, of course, it takes a little while to get all the power restored and all those critical infrastructure back in place. So that's what I would just say, forecasting for your preparedness to address the needs that we're seeing regarding these these issues with these storms. Yeah, those, those are all good points. I think we'll come back on some of those in a few minutes. Uh, but now I'll go to Colin if, if you want to maybe describe some of your tips going into the season. No, I would just elaborate uh, maybe a little bit more on uh, on what Ruby said. I, I think that um, what we're seeing is that we're having less time to react to these storms as they come. So I think staying connected um, is is the, the most single most important um, idea that you can do uh, to be prepared for hurricane season. And when I say st stay connected, it means whether you're in New Orleans, uh, you know, getting with NOLA ready and, uh, you know, texting NOLA ready to 77295 and getting those real-time alerts because I think more than ever what we're seeing with these storms, and, and I'll include Zeta and Ida and Laura and Delta and all of these storms we've had over the past few years, we're, we're not getting the five days of, of, you know, wait and watch. We're, we're looking at, you know, 48 to 36 hours of actionable time to actually, you know, evacuate or shelter in place in order to be ready for these storms. And so you're going to have to make a decision really quickly. And I think that, that that's incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we, you know, we saw, as you mentioned, and especially last summer with Ida. Um, so, yeah. And, and again, we'll come back on some of those issues and go a little bit more in depth on it. But uh, yeah, I'll go to Steve now, if Steve can um, can give us some of his tips. Oh, I think uh uh, the other two panels have covered major things, except I, I would add we each as individuals and as businesses or nonprofit organizations need to have in place a continuity of operations plan. That is, know on the upfront exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and how we're going to keep in business during and after a storm. Uh, you know, and that includes uh, having. Uh, your your capacity for your internet and communications out of the area as a backup, uh, making sure you back up data daily and not uh, w wait for weeks. Uh, so that's on the sort of corporate level. On the personal level, you also need to have your own not only evacuation plan, but you need to have that, that evacuation quick kit uh, ready to go. Red Cross has a uh, uh, you can go to Red Cross and they have a complete plan. You can check off what you need. And then finally, I'll add that in Louisiana in particular, we have a very robust 211 system, and it is a wealth of information, not just during uh, disasters, but also uh, all year round in terms of what resources and services are available for individuals. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to all three of you. Um, and yeah, I would just point out that, um, you know, if uh, if I'm remembering cor correctly, last year was, I think, the third busiest hurricane season on record. And that was after 05 and 2020, if I remember right. So we're getting we're getting more of these. Uh, the storms are intensifying and it's in, and that's a, a reason to think about preparedness more and to learn from past lessons. Uh, and to continue to learn to live with these threats. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, that would be a good a good second question, kind of what um, 
what lessons do you think we've learned from recent storms and how are those going to be applied moving forward? Um, maybe we'll start with Colin since we're in, since I'm in New Orleans today. Thanks. So, um, a couple of things, you know, again, I'll go back to the timelines, you know, um, everything's happening faster and decisions have to be made faster. Um, I think what we're seeing is somewhat of a transition where, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more indirect injuries and fatalities due to hurricanes rather than the direct, you know, um, drownings, um, you know, damage from, you know, from flying debris, things like that. What we're seeing is heat-related illness, heat-related death, and generator use uh, mishaps that are causing a tremendous amount of, um, I wouldn't say tremendous amount, but, uh, you know, injuries and fatalities uh, after the storm. And so we really, you know, here in the city, a lot of our planning has been around what we can do to provide for particularly the most vulnerable members of our population. Uh, with the, the post storm reality. And so, you know, that's um, emergency resource centers. You know, what we, what we used as cooling centers during uh, hurricane I or and after hurricane Ida. And then, you know, increasing our capacity to shelter post storm if we have to, uh, for people that may be coming back from evacuating that have challenges. And then overall, uh, increasing our ability to move people, particularly vulnerable populations, faster uh, prior to the storm if that becomes necessary. Yeah. Yeah, those are, those are great points. And I, I um, yesterday, I just point out, uh, I went to an event where um, this is more in the private sector, though I guess with city participation, where they're trying to set up um, community hubs, solar powered community hubs at churches and community centers. It looks like a great project. Um, I guess they're still raising money. They have some in hand already. Um, so I guess, I guess, Colin, that would help out a lot if those do get set up. I, I think that there, there can't be enough. So what we've done uh, post Ida, you know, we had eight uh, cooling centers. Now what we're called, we've codified it into a plan, our emergency resource centers. Uh, we had eight during Ida. You know, I'd like to see that more around 10 or 12. And, but what, with that, we need the availability of facilities. And so we're working with Entergy New Orleans right now in their power through program to increase the amount of transfer switching gear on facilities. Uh, rec centers in particular, libraries and the convention center to have uh, more ability to bring in power generation prior to the storm or immediately after, depending on the situation, in order to better serve our residents, our visitors and everyone that may be affected by the hurricane. But that community lighthouse program, I was there yesterday as well, uh, is a huge priority for us to support. I, I think that um, what we're learning and what we've learned over the years is we can't, as government, do this alone. We need everyone to you know, participate and to really take some ownership in their own safety, the safety of their neighbors, the safety of their friends, the safety of their pets, everyone. And, and I think that um, those types of public-private partnerships that you see are going to really be rewarding for us in the future. And I think that it, it's, it says a lot about New Orleans because the fact that this is kind of being piloted here in this city uh, you know, we are we're on the forefront of disaster management and, and unfortunately we've been tested. And so I think that the federal government, the Department of Energy, they all recognize that as well. And so there will be the ability to put solar microgrids on large centers like faith based uh, uh, churches, uh, houses of worship and other community centers that are outside of government in order to provide that same type of function, uh, particularly after a storm passes. Yeah, it's a great point. I think, you know, it's often said out of turmoil can, can also come opportunity to to learn how to thrive in these circumstances. And we can in some ways maybe lead the way uh, in some of these categories um, by developing expertise and showing uh, through these pilot programs, showing, you know, other locations how this can be done. Um, I was wondering on, on the state level, Ruby, um, what kind of lessons you all have learned over the years? Um, I guess I guess a lot of it involves coordination, um, uh, but maybe you could you can explain a little bit about that. 
Well, I tell you, it has filled, and I know Colin would agree with me, that we're feeling like we're in stranger things with all these back-to-back -back storms and still an ongoing pandemic. So uh, I'll just tell you, we start this hurricane season with 46 parishes of 64 parishes in Louisiana in some state of recovery. And I go back to um, what Mr. Uh, Zimmer said and Colin as well. We really need to be looking at uh, building capacity at the individual level and the local level because when we look at catastrophic damages, those infrastructures sometimes take a little bit longer. And what I'm, what I really am targeting is when you're looking at our people in the state of Louisiana, they are definitely no strangers to hurricanes. But definitely, uh, when we're talking about housing, uh, affordable, available housing, there's limited stock here. And so we need to be really looking at those vulnerabilities and making sure that those folks, uh, we actually refer to those folks that need other resources to be looking at a, another safer area to be. And sometimes that may be relocating to another area. I know that that's not very popular and nobody wants to say that, but uh, when we take about the last two hurricanes where we've had to use non-congregate sheltering to provide uh, temporary sheltering support for individuals, it creates a lot of stall in their recovery because they either cannot find the resources or there, there also are some limitations. And uh, I think educating those individuals how to navigate recovery services, because we do have some folks that may be living in what we call heritage houses and they don't have a clear title. Um, they can't prove ownership and occupancy to possibly get some jumpstart money from FEMA and not everybody qualifies for FEMA and get the same benefit. So really kind of understanding those resources and their vulnerability so they can actually uh, be safe, number one, but also um, recover more uh, convenient, I wouldn't say convenient, because everybody's still struggling over the same resources. Uh, prices of supply chains and prices of commodities relative to rebuilding and limited con contractors to rebuild all play a part in people's recovery. And so we really need to look at this very hardcore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that sort of leads right into the United Way's role, which, it, which, as I understand it, is sort of, in a lot of ways, filling gaps that government can't always provide in terms of helping people, some of the most vulnerable or some who can't afford to um, take care of themselves. So maybe, Steve, if you can talk about some of the, some of the lessons learned from that or, or correct me if I'm wrong on that. Well, I think uh, I, I want to echo what, what Ruby said and add a little bit to it. We are becoming more and more in Louisiana and in uh, southeast Louisiana uh, because of issues of affordable housing, uh, a society of renters. And you couple in the impact of COVID over the last couple of years and then add to that the inflation we're seeing now, the cost of rebuilding has gone skyrocketed and the cost of, uh, of housing is going up. Uh, for example, th there's been an 80% increase in the cost of soft lumber since Ida. 80%, 79 point something. That's 80 in my book. Uh, so th the cost of recovery has increased exponentially uh, in that context. In terms of... of uh, money, ra raising money to help those most in need, those who fall through the crack. We call them the unmet needs process. Um, one thing everybody needs to sort of understand is that volunteer dollars and resources can never uh, address the problem. It's too big a problem. And the other thing is that after a disaster, in the first four days, you're going to get about 80% of the contributions that are going to come to you. And yet, uh, uh, let me just take Grand Isle, which is part of, of Jefferson Parish. It, and they are still in, uh, uh, are trying to end a, a response phase. I mean, I, you know, personally, I'm in, I'm in a post-recovery phase. I have completed my recovery. Uh, but they're still in a response phase and haven't even really begun the process of long-term recovery. Um, I read a study years ago that helped me a lot. It says that from the time an event happens until you end that, that uh, response phase, there is a, if that is six months, let's say, 
then long-term recovery is going to take six years. And I remember back in 25, I, uh, 2006, I said uh, that, that recovery for Katrina is going to be 14 years and people thought I was crazy. Uh, but we know that's not, uh, that wasn't, that wasn't off at all. And, and we're going to find out that in Grand Isle, uh, their, their long-term recovery is going to be 10 years from now. And, uh, and yet financially, the nonprofit sector is not able to deal with that uh, because one, we get most of our money in the first few days after the disaster. And let's face it, donors want to see something done with their money. And so most money gets spent on response phase activities, uh, water, ice, uh, mucking and gutting, those kinds of things. Uh, and long-term recovery is where the biggest costs are involved. So it's a quandary that the nonprofit sector faces as to its role under uh, under the FEMA local, state, federal uh, umbrella. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Thanks, Stephen. And I would just point out on those on those points, Lake Charles serves as a prime example. There were a lot of renters. Uh, the states even said a, a high, a unusually high number of renters who were affected by Hurricane Laura and Delta. Um, and, and we forget how powerful Hurricane Laura was. It was one of the strongest storms to ever make landfall in the state. And because it's kind of far away from New Orleans and Baton Rouge, we, we sort of forgot about it. But um, that long-term recovery piece is going to be a very, you know, especially because of the delays they've seen in funding, um, it's going to take a long time. Um, so, yeah, we don't want to get too sidetracked on that, but those are very important points. Um, so, yeah, I, I wanted to get more into the kind of practical stuff, especially when it comes to evacuations, which I think a lot of people will have questions about um, and kind of, you know, um, stuff like when's the best time to evacuate, evacuate, what should they do before leaving, um, you know, um, and then sort of the, the process of evacuating, which I guess would be more for Ruby and Colin when it comes to those kinds of like when we do contraflow, which this, I understand that might get into some very complicated explanations, but uh, so maybe we don't have to get into every detail, but um, but I think we should maybe touch on it, but maybe first uh, before we get into those kinds of technical details, maybe I'll ask Steve kind of what, how you all uh, help. Um, I think it's often overlooked when people talk about evacuating that not everybody can evacuate or, or can afford to evacuate or is not physically capable of doing that. Um, is that something you all are involved in or advising or how do you how do you deal with that? Well, I must speak uh, broadly for the, the nonprofit community. Remember, many of these organizations have clients for which they have responsibility. Uh, there are sheltering programs. There are are uh, individuals who have limited uh, capabilities who need to literally be uh, e escorted out. Um, but my, my biggest major focus would be to recommend that we that we are indeed our brother's keeper. Uh, that we at, think about your neighbor. If each of us would just look at our immediate neighbor and say the and go up to her or him and say. You have a plan to evacuate and then maybe say, let me help you. We can address a lot of the problem with what happened in Katrina and what's happened in the disaster since by just remembering to be good neighbors. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a great point. Um, and so so Ruby, maybe you can explain a little bit about kind of how the state views this process. What's the state's role? And um uh, and maybe maybe explain a little bit about the process. I guess there's a there's a there's a there is a sort of schedule almost of how we should evacuate. Um, I know often with the way storms are intensifying now, as we touched on a little bit, it's often difficult to stick to that process. Um, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, as you know, we have over what 4.6 million people in the state of Louisiana and almost half of that live in the coastal Louisiana. And so it's important to understand. And we've gotten very good at looking at forecasts and definitely looking and listening to the meteorologist to provide predictions. It's important that we have to look at impacts because like even with uh, Laura Delta, the impact was uh, on the southwest part of the state, 
which uh, of course everybody, thank God we were in the COVID and we didn't have a lot of businesses and hotels and we kind of shifted those folks to be housed and supported and sheltering in hotels in New Orleans. So that's one key understanding of understanding the geography of Louisiana, but also getting back to also understanding the social economics of Louisiana people as well. I do worry about the cost of gasoline for folks to be able to transport to there, but you know, all emergencies are local. And so evacuations are not called by the governor's office. They're called by the local leadership there. So I want to defer some of the specific pinpoints and trigger points to Colin, because especially the stuff that they have provided at the local level really helps educate their people on when to listen to them, when to make those movements and targets. But when those evacuations are called, there are several, uh, we, have, we work with our other state agencies, DCFS, uh, Department of Transportation and Development on specific capabilities to help support state assisted evacuations. And the, our, our primary goal is to get people out of harm's way. So there is a method to get them at a pickup point to provide evacuations northern to certain sheltering op, uh, spots to help support their uh, of safe evacuation. So I guess I'll just go ahead and defer to Colin so he could talk about those trigger points because when we talk about contraflow, uh, there, there's, there's so many, when you look at the amount of people to get out, you got to be able to get that evacuation in the state assisted transportation buses off the roads before you can actually do contraflow. So Colin, I don't know, I don't want to take Mike's job, but I guess I'm going to tag team you to uh, finish that out. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and I, um, uh, I really appreciate Steve's remarks. You know, I, I, I've said it a few times myself that we, we've all had the neighbor uh, on our street that we know uh, if something bad was to happen, this person probably is not going to be able to, to handle this themselves. You know, and, and that's all over. That's every neighborhood all over the city. You know, if we can reach out and at least just identify who these people are and, you know, what their needs are and what family they have, you know, that's that's a huge uh, that that can make make a huge impact. And, and typically those are vulnerable. I, I will say many are seniors um, and, and we need to to be aware of that. Um, you know, I would say that uh, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, uh, you know, staying connected and making the decision, the best decision for you, whether it be to evacuate or shelter in place, depending on the storm. Um, you know, obviously for major storm evacuation is the is the primary means of ensuring your safety um, that you make that decision um, quickly and you enact it and and you, you know, execute your plan, you know, and that is to leave. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about mandatory, voluntary. You have to do uh, what's best for you. I share the same, um, you know, concerns this year about gas prices. Do not let that be a determining factor in, in potentially saving the life of yourself, your family, your friends, your pets. You know, make the right decision and and commit to that decision and execute it. Um, you know, contraflow is is another, you know, that, that is a last resort in itself. It takes an incredible amount of uh, coordination between two states, uh, public safety and transportation infrastructure, in order to, to get that going. And, and many ask about Ida. And look, when, when you have 48, 36, 24 hours uh, with these storms that we're seeing, rapidly intensifying storms, there, there is not the ability, and it's not safe, quite frankly, to set that up. Because, you know, you have to realize, you know, we work with the state very closely, but we also work very closely with our parish and regional partners all the way to the coast particularly here in Southeast Louisiana, you do not want to leave people on the road um, when the storm is, 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 um, is imminent. You know, you want to make sure that you have that clearance time that people are able to get out. And so, you know, these are challenges that we're looking at right now. And, that, and that's, you know, the challenge is um, with less notification, how do you still move 1.2 million people to evacuate? Um, when when the big ones come, and that's what we're we're challenged with right now. Yeah, those are those are great points. And maybe if if you all could just touch on briefly the sheltering situation. Um, I guess a lot of residents would would ask, 
would shelters be available? Should they rely on that as a place to go for overnight stays when a hurricane comes or should they first plan to get out somehow? I'd like to take that one right off the bat, get, get out somehow. If you can't get out yourself, if you have absolutely no other means of leaving, that is where we talk about the city assisted evacuation. Um, I, I will say that if we have the, the window of opportunity to do that, uh, based on the timeline of the storm, that will always be the preferred option. Okay. New Orleans is below sea level. It's protected by levees. We are intensely concerned about flooding. And so um, sheltering pre-storm is not something the city uh, and not something that the, the local government here can do safely. Having said that, if there are situations in the future where we have to look at a refuge of some sort, we will do that. But it will only be that if we are faced with these increasing or decreasing timelines on storms. The, the evacuation is the safest uh, method of ensuring your safety and the safety of your family uh, during a major hurricane. I'm, I'm, and I'm saying that for major storms, category three, four, and five. We routinely shelter in place for lower level storms. But again, if you're met, if you're dependent on electricity, if you're dependent on, uh, you know, other devices medically, you may decide uh, with your family that you need to evacuate for a tropical storm. And you know what? That's a great decision. It, it all really just depends on what your individual circumstances are. Yeah, and Ruby, maybe you could this you could talk a little bit about the state sheltering options. I know sometimes, or maybe always, I'm not sure. Maybe for major storms, for example, the the so-called mega shelter in Alexandria is opened. Uh, maybe you can describe how the state approaches those decisions a little bit. Yeah, well, those that that is, again is a process and is part of evacuation. And I kind of want to echo what Colin says. It's important for them to plan ahead of time and not to wait. Uh, we see the intensification of these storms being catastrophic in nature. So when we look at that, I'll just tell you, I'm a preacher of comfort. I'd rather be in a uh, family's home than I would actually being in my car or a shelter because there's not a lot of privacy in a shelter. And the other thing is we don't know what the impact would be. And so at that point, uh, we work real heavily with the Department of Children and Family Services, the Louisiana Workforce Commission, which makes up our emergency support function six for mass care. And they have a plan that provides that. Now, Red Cross does provide general shelter population shelters uh, for storm evacuations uh, to provide for those care and comfort in a safe environment for those survivors. Uh, but if the critical transportation needs shelter and other shelters, uh, we will pull those trigger points for those individuals. You don't just uh, drive up to that and DCFS takes the lead on that. Uh, so that's what I would kind of just echo on that. But it's important for us to be thinking about making sure you and your family are out of harm's way Going back to Steve, making sure you know your neighbor and we kind of re-echo that. We are definitely long past the times of I've lived through Bessie and I lived through Camille. These storms are dangerous. And when we talk about, I know Colin made a point to talk about the um, cat, cat, you know, hurricane cat, category three. But we also know that tropical storms and no-name storms can cause great flooding to areas as well. So that's that's one key point that I think listeners need to concentrate on. Yeah, that's uh, that's well said. I mean, you know, we have this new levy and, and flood protection system that was very expensive and, and is very well built. But at the same time, even the designers of it will say this will be overtopped one day. So we need to keep that in mind and not take, you know, take comfort, but not uh, absolute comfort in the levy system because um, there's still a need to get out when that's important. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and so I guess just more on the kind of individual level, um, you know, uh, especially maybe for people who haven't been through a major storm, although if you live in the state, you by this time, I'm sure you, you almost everyone has, but um, maybe just some things uh, around your house. I mean, what needs to be done before you evacuate? If maybe you all could describe just a few basic things, uh, maybe Ruby, if you want to start with that. 
Well, I would try to kind of echo our www.getagameplan.org. It does have check various different checklists and opportunities for businesses, families, and even kids to make their own plans. You know, it's important. We always talk about inventorying our house, and it's nice when, you know, I do know that there are several folks that still are struggling, even with insurance, uh, to recover. So taking pictures of what you have before so you can document that. I can't say that enough because when you, uh, when you, when, uh, when a storm happens and it's such at a degree that FEMA is uh, requested, you have to be able to be able to articulate your, you know, your damages, your property and those kinds of things. I think it's also important for you to also mitigate your property. Uh, are your ditches cleaned out? Uh, are your gutters cleaned out? Are there any kind of overhanging uh, items? It also is important for us. Uh, I know oftentimes when people buy a house, everybody's like, oh, yay, I'm all excited. I got a house and we got to go. But there's a lot of investment relative to that home ownership, like understanding how you can turn off the water at your house. Those are key things that kind of can help mitigate some efforts. And I'll just tell you, I know everybody has Jake from State Farms and they know what color khakis he wears, but it's important to also really understand your policy. I know we take that for granted a lot of times of what the coverage is. One of the saddest things I've ever heard is when we had the great floods of 2016 and there was a lot of people that did have flood insurance, but they did not have contents. It's important to review those uh, policies, those insurance policies. Uh, and even with Ida, there's a lot of people that got loss of use on their policies and they actually could get hotel stays when they're purchased by their insurance company. So I think it's important to do an insurance checkup too, uh, as well as uh, making sure you have emergency savings because I uh, can't say it enough. Uh, when we look at costs of things going up and having to be displaced for a little while before we get back, to our uh, our homes, it, it takes a lot to make sure you're keeping receipts and you're documenting that. Yeah, absolutely. And we've, we've seen in recent storms the battles people have had with their insurers. So those are especially good points on, on that on that count. And people, I think, sometimes surprised that there's a hurricane deductible, uh, a named storm deductible in their homeowners, which they should also be aware of uh, and know the details of that. Um, and Colin, did you have anything you, you would add to those points? I would definitely uh, echo the insurance, you know, really important to have both homeowners and flood insurance, whether you, whether you are required to have flood insurance or not get flood insurance. Typically, if you're not required to have it, it's, it's even more reasonable. Uh, so, please look into it. You know, there's, we have a, a lot of folks that, that still are resistant to flood insurance in our area. And I, I just don't understand why. So really got to look at that. I would say also while you're doing the preps for your home, look out on your block and in your street where you are and look at some of those, those community based um, infrastructure as well. Uh, particularly I'll, I'll say for new Orleans uh, and, and, you know, uh, the Metro area storm drains and then, New Orleans has 72,000 storm drains and about 10 vacuum trucks. So do the math. You know, you can, they go on a regular schedule of preventive maintenance on these, but really it's complaint based is, is the most effective way of us making sure that a lot of those drainage basins are cleared. And so if you have uh, the ability to remove small debris out in front of your house yourself, we certainly would appreciate the help. But if it's a larger job or something that requires somebody getting into the storm drain, um, call 311. And, you know, once we know those are on the list, they're a lot easier to respond to quickly because we know that there's an issue at, at a storm drain. And so and, and other things like that, you know, watching out for your neighbors uh, and uh, their properties, their garbage bins, your garbage bins or garbage carts, making sure that all of that stuff is pulled in. Uh, into your fence line or into your, your yard, your proper yard, uh, in order to make sure that, you know, all those things float at some point, uh, even even during afternoon rainstorms. So once they float, they tip over, they end up in the storm drains, the debris. Uh, I, I think it's important that we try to do as we can to, to mitigate any drain, drainage complications that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I would, I, would, I would add to that maybe make plans for your pets. Don't leave your pets behind. You know, a lot of people, you know, I 
never understood people doing that. But in any case, um, yes, yeah, Steve, you, do you have any any kind of um, any tips you want to you'd want to add to that? When you're looking to evacuate, think north, west, and east. Uh, I know I have a I have a location. I will go with you want friends and families and motels and and then if you if if you don't have those then you you've got to look at the the Red Cross and other emergency shelters. But you need to have three of them really. You need to have I have relatives west. I have relatives east. My friend who said he would take care of us has moved. So I got I've got to find a new north now. So. Uh, Think think all four directions. That's that's uh, important. And like I said, uh, double check on your insurance. Uh, a lot of people after after uh, Ida were surprised by the size of their deductibles and what that what the impact of that was. Uh, I literally, you know, have a have a little slush fund that's that makes my deductible fund and it's money I'm not going to touch because I've got to have that. And when the tree falls on the house, well, there's two other things that just to be aware of. One is after Katrina, a lot of work was done and a lot of roofs. Ida, most of the damages that I've seen wind related were uh, roofs. And so uh, the, the, and most of those roofs that were damaged were ones that weren't fixed after Katrina. Uh, and if it hadn't been for Katrina, we would have had a lot worse damage in uh, this area by uh, Ida. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. We do have a few questions from readers that uh, I wanted to put to you all. Um, uh, some of it we've already touched on, but um, we can sort of fill in some of the gaps there. And so one, the first one is, um, and this goes back to kind of what we were talking about, about cooling centers and hubs. Um, has any thought been given to building large multi-purpose gymnasiums adjacent to schools that could serve as evacuation centers. The buildings would have solar and other energy sources, will be built to incorporate large kitchen areas um, and sufficient restroom facilities. Uh, the structures would be out to good use on a daily basis uh, by serving as gymnasiums, and they could be located throughout the city and also north of I-12. Um, possible funding sources uh, are bond issues and state appropriations. Schools would benefit and would realize a cost savings. Um, I guess maybe Colin, that, that's um, since New Orleans is, has cooling centers and, and has been involved, maybe you could address that a bit. No, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, it, it's a complicated topic. You know, there was an opportunity to pursue that direction uh, after Katrina. Um, it was determined at the time uh, when rebuilding all of the schools. You know, there was a, a lot of conversation about hardened schools. Uh, you know, well above base flood elevation with this, the types of multi-purpose. Uh, space that that could be used as a shelter. Ultimately, that was the that was not the route that was taken. I think we've taken a more evacuation focused route. Um, and and look, I, I do believe that the evacuation is the safest. Um, as I've said a couple of times, it's this the really the only guaranteed way that you're going to be safe from a major hurricane in New Orleans. But what we are doing is trying to enhance the uh, our our capability to provide the, the sheltering and uh, types, those types of services post-storm. And, and the idea is, and, and Steve talked about it a little bit, um, the idea is getting people back um, to you know, where they are, uh, getting them back to whatever the normal is or close to normal that they can be and get your economy and get, your, get recovered or get recovery at least started. And so, Getting people back into the area, I think, is a, is a huge priority for us. We've worked with the state uh, over the years, and I think that there's still continuing work to actually address kind of some of that larger sheltering capacity uh, outside of the area north of I-12. Um, you know, and the state has looked at, at other facilities, and, and they, they've been pretty innovative. Uh, and, and look, I think Laura's a, uh, Hurricane Laura is a perfect example of that. The ability to use non-congregate sheltering like that, throw that together, Ruby um, is is a rock star in my opinion. Um, that that made a huge difference for twelve thousand people from Lake Charles and, and the Southwest Louisiana. So I think there are capabilities and abilities to maybe look at that. Um, but I think we also need to be realistic that in these major storms, category four and five, you really need to consider evacuation more than trying to stay here. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Ruby, maybe you could talk about the state's perspective on that. Um, as you know, the the, the non congregate option. I don't know if that can always be an option. I imagine it seems co costly. I mean, I'm not, just me personally talking to a lot of people in Lake Charles, they were very happy with that effort. They they and they were pleased with it. Um, I don't know how practical that is. I know sort of post storm, you all are trying out a pilot. Um, after Ida with delivering trailers, um, that might be a little bit beyond our, our scope here, but, but, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe um, you could address the topic a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'll just tell you, so the reason why we went to non-congregate was because we were still in a public health emergency with COVID. And so th that policy is usually kind of, uh, you know, provided through FEMA to allow us some different flexibilities and sheltering options. But to be honest with you, I'll just tell you, I do have a staff member here that has lots of experience in mass care. And even in the state of Florida, they do not do their sheltering operations like we do in, in Louisiana. In fact, a lot of theirs are gymnasium and you just have the floor with no wraparound services. So we know that her, uh, in the state of Louisiana, we take a little bit better care of our citizens. But uh, getting back to that, I just think it is important to understand that sometimes there are not these provisions in place. I think the non-congregate sheltering is still in place because we still are experiencing some COVID infection issues. Uh, so that may be available there. Uh, but going back to that, you know, they need to make sure that they're comfortable because I can just tell you, even if you're in a congregate sheltering, you're sleeping on a cot. That's you, your stuff your kid, uh, you you know, there is a provision for a pet plan too, but it's just not the comfort of home. And so we really need to get citizens to be looking at building capabilities ahead of time. Going to back what Colin said, I know that there's a lot of community planning that's going on at the local level, but there are hazard mitigation um, monies available to kind of do some of those things to kind of help meet the needs regarding uh, the, the threats that the, the community goes through. But it's important that people understand that our number one focus for the state and the local level is to make sure people are safe and out of harm's way. Uh, and we're going to provide those uh, contingencies there. But hotels may not be always an option. And the other thing is from a survivor specific, uh, perspective, we've done that as non-congregate sheltering. But then FEMA also has its transitional sheltering uh, assistance program. And Red Cross sometimes had voucher programs. And so the survivor believes this happens all the time. And so they don't have a, a, a good understanding of what's the next emergency support for those uh, individuals. And I'll just tell you, we even had to do base camps because when Ida impacted so much of the state, 25 parishes were declared for individual assistance. Uh, all TSA was turned on and we didn't have hotels to put folks. So uh, other options were kind of looked at as well, just to provide people uh, immediate sheltering and safe and secure areas uh, closer to their domicile because Colin is right. People do not like to go too further up north. Uh, they like to be close where they are. And if that's all you have, you're trying to rebuild and repair and stay close to home so you can salvage what you have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Steve, has in the nonprofit sector, have you all looked at some of those options or what kind of how do you see your role in those in those sort of proposals? Uh, this is an area that is the re responsibility of the Red Cross uh, under the national plan. And uh, they do have uh, those emergency shelters. But in terms of building new, uh, I'm just not aware of what they're doing right now in that area. OK, I know it's a budget issue always. Right. Yes. Which which is a, an entirely other subject. Yeah. Um, OK, well, we'll, we'll take one more um, before we go We're running out of time. But um, but uh, we I think we can squeeze one more in. Um, uh, uh, let's see. We've got here. Um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, I guess this maybe the we, we touched a little bit on insurance, but maybe we could we could expand on that a little bit. Um, the, the reader writes the, if your insurance company hasn't paid the claim and is now defunct and you're making repairs as best you can. What is your recourse in the event of another storm? I realize that may be a bit out of your expertise, but I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. 
Well, I'll take it. Um, you know, I know I know Steve might have some other resources too, but I think we need to be looking at other available resources, even pre and post storms. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually has a home rebuild and repair loan program. I know a lot, everybody doesn't like a loan, but they actually have qualifying small interest loans. Also, uh, there are co-ops with various different financial organizations that do disaster specific uh, repairs as well. So exploration of other available local, state and even federal resources to help rebuild and repair, uh, even because as, as, as Steve eloquently put, the, the prices of rebuilding for people and places and things have gone up tremendously. And so I would definitely encourage folks to go to um, www.getagameplan.org. Uh, if they look in the virtual sessions, we did a whole series of these for Laura and Delta because we couldn't have that direct contact, but it could actually help you learn how to navigate some of those federal resources. So that is also a, a very good option for them to look into. Absolutely. I, I would just say that, you know, this is a, a rather common question and uh, it's difficult for us here at the city level uh, because, you know, we feel kind of uh, on the sideline a little bit about it. it. It's a little bit outside of what our capabilities are as an office. But I will say that there is kind of a, you know, a rub here where, you know, while the insurance company has 30 days to pay you on a claim, they don't they have no requirement in time as to how long they can either accept or deny a complaint, uh, a, um, a case uh, or a, um, a claim. So, you know, when, if you feel like you're being hustled by this, by insurance companies, you need to get an attorney. Uh, you know, there's a lot of resources too for attorneys uh, outside of going and, and hiring and paying for one. Uh, that's obviously a great option, but if you, there are some uh, law clinics and um, nonprofits that can assist with, uh, you know, uh, legal services. And I, and I think that's your best route. And, and really just to start dealing with the, the state insurance commissioner because they're really big on, um, you know, on making sure that these types of things don't happen, you know, or that they're, that they're settled and um, to, the, to the homeowner or the, pro, the, the insured's um, benefit to the greatest extent possible. So I really think that that's the route to go. Yeah, and there is there is a complaint process through the insurance commissioner, uh, even through the website, I believe. Um, and I, I, I think that can result in some action. I, I don't, I wouldn't say it always does, but um, and, and, if problem. I could, I would add that, that the other side of that too is um, contractor fraud um, and abuse and, and it happens and it's, it's vile. I'll just put it that way. There's no other way of saying it, um, you know, and so that is certainly where uh, at the local level, your district attorney's office, they are, they they are chomping at the bit after these things to go after these cases. Um, and, and typically, if they can make an example out of one um, contractor who's doing this, it, it makes a big difference. And then at the state level, clearly, you've got the Louisiana Board of Contractors and you've got the Louisiana Attorney General's Office who, who all deal with disaster fraud and, um, and those types of things that are just, unfortunately, they happen, you know. And, and I've seen a lot of, um, work in, in the legislature this year to address some of these types of price gouging and and other things that that can occur after disasters yeah that's that's really important i mean contractor fraud has become such a big issue in recent years and people should really um watch who you're dealing with take pictures of even the person and his car and his license and there are ways you can look up online whether they're licensed um all those sorts of things um yeah steve um before we wrap up do you have do you have some thoughts on those on those issues well fema has provided funding through the state for what's called the disaster case management program and the dcmp has just now been launched uh, and what that involves is for each parish there are case managers who will be providing a, a individual case management for people who are falling through the cracks uh, they can call 211 and get the contact information to, for their parish of, of who to, uh, to get on the, uh, in the queue of that. Uh, I might say that, that uh, we then have established what we're calling our long-term recovery committees uh, for the parishes that, that, that we serve. Um, 
and there's one long-term recovery group that that serves Jefferson Orleans, St. Bernard, and Plaquemines Parish. And uh, then there are in other parishes, there are long-term recovery groups and their unmet needs committee. And I will just say that uh, we had a case that came before our committee just last week uh, of someone whose insurance company went bankrupt and they needed uh, a new roof. And, and uh, one of our partners has agreed to, uh, to put that roof on. And this was someone who was impacted by the tornado. The, the after Katrina in St. Bernard Barry. So uh, there are resources out there uh, to address that kind of thing, but call 211 as an individual to get uh, uh, referral information uh, for your parish. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks to all three of you. I mean, that's some extremely useful information. And I think uh, hopefully a lot of people will benefit from that as we go deeper into this season and we get into the real sort of, worrisome part of this season and we can all hope that we you know we don't have another serious hurricane but as we've known from past years we can hope for the best but we have to prepare for the worst because that's the reality of living and of, of life in south louisiana so yeah thanks again um i really appreciate uh, you all's time and uh, i hope everyone gains something from this thanks mike thank you so much for having us let's look forward to the next time